Saturday afternoon post game, I am joined by Philadelphia's number one hockey beat reporter, Charlie O'Connor. That was uh, quite a viewing experience today. Charlie. Yeah, that was indeed a hockey uh, game. We did, not see, <laughs> we did not see the same level of play from the Flyers that we no. saw in Thursday's season opener. Uh, matinee Saturday, home opener in Ottawa. Just, uh, I think this is what I, we just need to come to expect from this team, that they are going to be capable of looking good on some nights. Yeah. They're not going to be a flat-out disaster. Like, if the Sharks or the Canadians are a flat-out disaster, no one's going to no one's going to really be surprised by that. The Flyers can be a disaster. Through 35 minutes tonight, they had three even-strength shots on goal. Yikes. Uh, not very good. But we're just going to kind of see inconsistency out of them when those top four guys that we spent so much time talking about after Thursday's game play to their highest level, they're going to have a chance to win a lot of nights when they don't. Uh, they are going to spend most of the game in the defensive zone as we saw today. Yeah. I, I think my big takeaway from this game, and like you said, they showed in game one that they're most likely not going to be a dumpster fire, but Today was an example of what happens when you have the defense core that they have. And in fairness, this isn't their full decor. You know, if if they get the wrist align from last year, that should help a bit. I think Zamula maybe doesn't have the ceiling of Emil Andre, but right now is probably the better defenseman. So they do have a path to making the defense core a bit better quickly if they want to. But it's still basically Travis Anheim who... I really like, but is, is a second, is a pair, second guy. pair guy. He's their number yeah. one. He's their number one. And you go from like... Yeah, then you go from there. Your I mean, best guy doesn't belong on a top pair. Exactly. Now, maybe he... Ch throughout this season, maybe he changes our mind and we go, you know what? As a lefty playing the right side, if they get a, like a true number one, he could be that guy. But it's still going to be... Yeah, Matt Carl was the number two. Yeah, but because Chemo, Chris Pronger yeah. is Kino team and it was the yes, number two. <laughs> exactly. But like you're able to anchor pairs differently and all that. But yeah. that's that's Sanheim ceiling. When he's your best, and you go from there, chances are your deep core not gonna be great. Yeah, and and behind Sanheim, you have Cam York, who who had one good moment in this game with that goal. Very nice goal. But beyond that, didn't make a huge impact that he has he had a Tough screen on the the end of the second period goal. Granted, that was more on Sanheim for the, the bad turnover, but he didn't exactly shower Ooh. himself in glory either, Cam York. And then beyond those two guys, it's honestly kids and then a bunch of dudes. Like, I actually thought out of the defenseman, I thought Sean Walker probably had the most consistent game out of we everybody. We might say that a lot this yeah, season. Yeah, I mean, he looks fine, but beyond that... Like, like when York and Sanheim play well... We're going to notice them. Yeah. And so we'll have good things to say about them. But when they play poorly, like, man, we've talked about it with Sanheim. It's just something you have to accept. Yeah. When, when he, he, when he makes up, mistakes, they it's... end up in the back of the net. And we saw that with that one turnover yeah. today. And, and, and but we're going to see it like with Sanheim. Walker a lot, the steadiness. Yeah. It wasn't like Sanheim was awful. No, he wasn't terrible. He made, he made plays. Yeah. He had some good shifts. It was just when he had bad shifts, they were real, real bad. And that's Travis Sanheim. Like, the guy we saw in game one, that is probably the ceiling of Sanheim. And maybe we're going to get more games really like that. Good. It was he's really good. He's got a high ceiling. But then he has games like this where he's going to get out-muscled by Claude Giroux and make really bad turnovers. 35 and a half year old Claude Giroux. He made him look like Pavel Datsuk yeah, out right? there. Like, yeah. ripping the puck away, finding the open man. Like, uh, I get, it's G. It's not as if he doesn't have one of the best sticks in the league for the last decade and a half. He's a great but player. You would think prime age Sandheim against 35 year old G would be able to shield the puck and figure something out there. And the thing that killed me with that play, too, I, I said it to you because we were watching the game in the studio, is there's like seven seconds left in the period. Just eat the puck. Do literally anything yeah, else. Just eat the puck. Like skate it into the corner and just eat it and kill time. He did the one. And, and the, the sad part about it was. He had made a really good defensive play right before that. He'd broken up a pass. It looked like he he shut down the that, play that leading offense. up to it was good. Yeah, like, yeah. He, you saw the full Sanheim trajectory, yeah. like the complete three. It was a three hundred and sixty. Like ah, uh, <laughs> you're not like, wrong. It was that was Sanheim. You're not wrong. But but yeah, you know Sanheim was inconsistent. York was inconsistent. Walker I thought was fine, and then everybody else like. I guess props to Nick Steeler for dropping the gloves to support his teammate, but he 
really wasn't moving the puck at all. Mark Stahl wasn't good. You know, it's just this is what we're gonna this is what we're gonna deal with. And granted, like Sealer did serve a five minute penalty for fighting. Twelve minutes tonight. Twelve. Yeah. yeah. And the thing with Sealer is he is who he is. Like I'm not I, I'm not even really criticizing guys like Sealer and Stahl. No. They just this is what they are. They are steady guys who could bring some physicality, can take a decent third pair shift here and there. But if you're asking them to be half your defense, which they kind of are, then you're going to have a bad time a lot of nights. And this to me was just, I'm not writing off this team entirely off of one game, but I will say that this kind of game was a lot more what I expected going into the season. And that's maybe we'll have a lot more of these going in. Now we're like, we're at 50, 50 right now, you know, two games, uh, how much of Thursday's, you know, I was optimistic after Thursday's game. If, even if not optimistic, it's not as if I want this team to be mediocre, yeah, but I'm just thinking cool about, they were good. Yeah, be, thinking about what this team could be. Maybe they're closer to mediocre than really bad. How much of what we saw on Thursday was a bunch of dudes played very well, and how much of it is the Blue Jackets are still horrible? You know, you look at the Blue Jackets roster and they, they shouldn't be they shouldn't bad. be horrible. That said, they did, you know, they lose Wierenski and they, they lost Wierenski and like they lost their coach be, right before the start of camp. I'm sure that there is a little bit of turmoil going on there in terms of, you know, you you prep for one guy and then you have to basically create a system from Instilling scratch. Instilling structure yeah. when it's like you weren't our coach yesterday. <laughs> but I also think that honestly, like. It can be both things. Like it can be that yeah, Columbus yeah. isn't that good of a team, but the Flyers played a good game. They they legitimately played a good game. I think if they would have played against most teams, that kind of game, it would have been tight. It would have like, been tight. They would have at least played well. They yeah. would have played well. Yeah. So I don't think we we can just write that game off as well. That was a flu. Columbus just stinks. Like yes, Columbus might stink, but the Flyers played well. And some nights they're going to play well. Other nights they're going to look like they did today. And so story of the day, at least prior to puck drop was Andre and Forster in, Zamula and Brink out. Right. Uh, Andre, the only time I really noticed him was when he was getting hammered in the corner. Uh, he might have been a little slow to go to the corner on one play where he was trying to clear it, but for the most part, it was a an uneventful NHL debut yeah, for Emil yeah, Andre other than getting laid out a couple times. But he wasn't bad. And that's exactly the, the point I made when we were watching it. You know, because I, I tweeted that, you know, that wasn't the best moment for Emil Andre, obviously, on the lead up to that first goal. And somebody said, well, what did you expect him to do? He just got knocked over. Like, that's going to happen to anybody. And that's not wrong. But you have to go into the corner with a little bit more urgency. Like, he just kind of glided in. He had positioning to get to that puck. Yes. And they got there at the same time, and they should not. Yeah, have. exactly. He he had the ability to get to that one first and make a play on the puck. And, yeah, he might have taken the hit, but he would have gotten the puck moving before he took the hit. And that's just something he's going to have to learn. Like, this is the difference between SHL pace and NHL pace. That in the SHL, you probably can just glide into the corner because the guys are – you know, a quarter of a step slower than they are in the NHL. And in the NHL, they're on you and they're on you immediately. And you got to do everything quicker. And I think Andre is going to learn that. It's going to take time, but he's going to learn it. Whether that's going to continue to happen in the NHL, whether they're going to send him down to the AHL eventually, I'm not sure. I don't have a problem with him learning on the fly up here, but fans have to accept that those kind of mistakes are going to happen when you're grooming a young defenseman at the NHL level. And it's, I mean... We talked about this earlier in the week when the most effusive praise the coach who really likes this guy yeah. has for him is, oh, he's not afraid to make mistakes and he made a ton of them, but he still made the team. It seems as if at least when he's in the lineup, they are willing to live with the ups and downs of Emil Andre. That's what you do with young players. Yeah. If you d aren't willing to live with that, they wouldn't be here. Uh, I assume, based on what they've done the first two nights, we're going to see Igor Zamula on Tuesday. Would you argue with that? It seems like this strongly hints that it's going to be a rotation, at least to start the year, especially because Zamula wasn't playing. Because, like, Brink was, I think we all sort of agreed, he was fine but not spectacular in Game 1. To me, it made all the sense in the world to bring Forrester in Definitely. over him. Sure. Zamula was legitimately good he in game well. one. Yeah. And it was disappointing to me that he was out because I thought he deserved game two. But if you're 
make if you're setting the the expectation of these guys that hey it's a rotation you're going to get games everybody's going to get games and then if and when someone gets hurt or if and when someone basically makes it clear that I'm playing so well I can never be removed from the lineup they'll make a decision but I don't really have a problem with with a rotation to start the year my big concern has always been are they going to get these kids playing time I was happy that they got the two kids who were scratching game one playing time in game two as long as they're playing regularly I don't need them in the in the lineup every single game. I just need them playing enough to justify them being up here, number one. And then number two, so that they're able to, to learn. They're able to, to get experience. It's not like you're playing one game and then you're sitting two weeks and then you're playing another game. Like, that's not going to help anybody. So as long as they're getting in there, like, would I rather see Andre and Zamula both in instead of Mark Stahl or Nick Sealer? Yeah, probably, because it's more interesting. It's more interesting to watch a kid learning than it is to watch a 36 year old do what a 36 year old does. But I'm not going to yell about it as long as they're getting the kids in regularly, they're getting each of the kids in regularly. That's we talked about this. I think yesterday, like this is going to work itself out in one way or another injuries, trades, what have you. I'm fine with this rotation for right now. If at the end of the year, these four guys, Andre Forster, Zamula, and Brink, have each played 41 games, that's not enough. That's fair. Like, I'm yeah. fine with this rotation now, especially we talked about this uh, when we were watching the game or before the game. Rookie walls exist. Yeah. And we're going to have to be doing this February to April, too. <laughs> uh, I want these guys to, like, still be alive by then. I don't want to, well, yeah, they're out of gas. They're only playing once a week. Or when they're out there, they just kind of suck. Like, if they're a little more fresh for those last two, three months of the season because they only played half the games for the first two months, I can live with that. Yeah. But I'm going to need to see more consistent playing time for all of them as the season goes on. But for this very moment, I'm cool with what they're doing. Uh, I, I, I want to change the subject a little okay. bit for, from our, uh, our pal Adam Bortz. Um Talking about the young vets not standing out. I noted that on Twitter, specifically... Tippett, Cates, Farabee, I and I would absolutely say Frost in there. I think Farabee has been... Farabee scored in the first yeah, game. I, I thought Far he was fine today. I think Farabee's been fine. Um, Frost, I, I did really like that play in the third. That was awesome. Before then, he was invisible. That's, I had literally just in the outline like done my positives and negatives and was like, has anybody noticed Frost and, and Tippett? And then... Frost makes one of the most noticeable yeah, plays of the great game, play. makes an interception, comes back in, makes a great move around the defenseman. Nice save by Forsberg, but he draws a penalty. That was good. Need to see more of that out of uh, out of Morgan Frost. But yeah, the I guess the young vets are the ones like the guys we're looking to take a next step or at least continue what they did last year have been. A bit of a disappointment for. Yeah. I mean, we're we're it's, six it's, periods it's in. Games, we're six but, periods in. Yeah. Uh, but uh, this is again, this is what the season's about. Yeah. It's while yeah, Andre Forster, these guys are interesting. The dudes who broke out last year need to continue to play that way if they're going to want to be part of the next good Flyers yes. team. Yes. Agreed. I, I think. Frost to me, and I hate piling on him because some people think I pile on him. Aside from that play in the third, I think was the most invisible, underwhelming of that group. Cates hasn't been as good as I want him to be. He was not, he, he didn't shower himself with glory on that Andre play because, eh. I mean, Andre, before he gets crushed he rims the puck around and like i'm not saying it was a perfect pass it was a little high it was a little difficult but kate's can't let that puck bounce all the way out into the slot he has to find a way to, he has to kill that he has to kill he has he doesn't necessarily have to make a great play but he can't let the puck just bounce off of him and go to a high danger area he's supposed to be the defensively sound guy that was a rough play and he hasn't shown anything offensively yet we were hoping he was going to take a step in that area this year through two games he's been pretty much invisible there Tippett's interesting because I am noticing him he actually had nine shot attempts in this game so led that led the team in shot attempts by a fair margin uh, I like think the second Do you have second uh, close at five it was Hathaway connecting in York but he's not hitting the net enough number one and number two he just doesn't seem he, he isn't taking over games last year, like he did a lot of times last, last year especially late it was Oh wow, the team looks like shit. And every time Tippett's on the ice, yeah. he does something that like energizes you and makes you want to keep watching. We haven't seen that Owen Tippett yet. Um, 
I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you have the breakdown of shot attempts, how many were power play versus even strength? There was not a ton of even strength time yeah, in this game. Let's, let's see there here. was a ridiculous amount of penalty calls on both sides, and then in the third period, it seemed like the game was being officiated ridiculously. Yeah. But I did seem to hear his name a lot more on the power play. Yeah, actually, no. Tibbet had seven shot attempts at even strength. Oh, okay. He's just shooting a lot. And yeah, I don't necessarily right. think that's a bad thing no, because he's a he's great shooter. But he has more to his game. And he's a guy where, I mean, shit... Jim Jackson before the season projected him to score 40, 40 goals. So we have high expectations for Owen Tippett. I think my ex- my expectations for Tippett out of the group of the young vets, maybe it's around the same for Farabee, but I think Tippett was where I had my highest expectations. I'm expecting him to have a big year. And it's not that he's been horrible. It's just that I want more from him. You know, whereas like Konechny, he's been real good. He's doing exactly. He looks, like he looks like Konechny. Looks like the same guy from last year. I look at Tippett as I want him to be on Konechny's level, and so far he has not been. Especially like and TK out there. Look, these are fine players. I don't want to disparage them, but Cates and Lawton are not exactly Farabee and Couturier. Yeah, like he's he's supposed to be anchoring that line, and then he's getting chances on the power play as well. Uh, and TK, I think, has looked like TK, but we've come to expect that. In terms of the expectations for the young vets, like I'm crossing my fingers on Farabee and really hoping for him because I want it to work. Right. But like Tippett, I was just like, oh yeah, pencil in for 30. Yeah, he'll be fine. Like, pencil in for 30, and 35 to 40 would be, oh, he took the next step. Yeah. Like in my mind. And I think he'll be fine. Again, we're, we're through two games. It's, it, two it's games. just It's just worth noting that... There are some guys who you expect more from that we came into the year expecting more from or hoping to see them take the next step. And not only through two games have they not taken the next step, they look less effective than they did the final two, three months of last season. It's it's not a major concern yet, but obviously in an ideal world, you'd want everybody to get off the hot starts and they haven't. So Bobby Brink in game one, fine, but not spectacular by any stretch. No. Tyson Forster steps into that spot today. I thought, especially early, I liked his movement on the uh, power play. Because at one time in the early power plays that they had, he's kind of in the Ovi spot. And I was like, I don't love him here. Mm. And then by the time he sets up the Konechny goal, he's like at the right point stepping in. And I really, really liked him over there. Uh, It just seemed like a more natural fit for him. Uh, And he seemed noticeable from there, made a few plays uh, other than that, though, was there anything that really stood out to you about Tyson Forster? Like, Forster v. Brink uh, through two games, each have played one. Who are we going to give a W to? I think Forrester was better than Brink. I-, I thought Forrester made more plays. He had one really, really bad shift where he passed up on a shooting opportunity, then turned the puck over, and then took a penalty back-checking. That was rough, but I thought he made more plays than Brink did. I mean, obviously, he got the primary assist on the TK 5-3 yeah. goal, which was just, it wasn't an amazing play, but he gets a shot through. Get it in. He shoots for mm-hmm. a rebound, and TK bats it in, which is great. That's exactly what you want from Tyson Forrester on the power play. I guess, ideally, you want him sniping goals into the net but but when you it, it, it helps when you have the puck where he is and the space you have to shoot it's hard to beat a goalie from that distance yeah. like a yeah. couple of guys in the league can beat goalies consistently from that distance get it on net get the rebound he did his job on that play yeah. absolutely but but I, I would say that i think forrester was more effective in his game than brink was not that either of them were mind-blowingly great but forrester he also made quite a few good passes um, set up a few scoring chances, which I like to see. So I came away, you know, obviously he's a rookie. He's going to make some mistakes. But I came away thinking that I was more impressed with Forrester's game than Brink. My guess is they just keep this rotation going until, as we said, either somebody gets hurt or one of the two guys makes it clear that they are in the lead. I think Forrester played a little bit better, but I don't think he blew anybody away to the point where, you know, he's going to make them sit Brink for a week. Tell you, I am... Uh... I am getting blown away in the picks competition by Kelly right now. <laughs> uh, she cashed two of her uh, goal bets in the first game. I am now 0 for 6 so far Ouch. picking goal scorers. Who did, I had Giroux today as well as I have it right in front of me. I had Giroux, Farabee, and Tippett to score today, uh, bringing my record to 0 and 6. Uh, so if you want to fade me, 
<laughs> I'll tell you where you should do it. You should do it at DraftKings Sportsbook. Uh, listen, the NFL season is going strong, and DraftKings Sportsbook is hooking new customers up with an offer that's even stronger. Bet five bucks on any game this week to score two hundred dollars instantly in bonus bets, and DraftKings isn't stopping there. All customers can take advantage of a sweetener offer every game day this October. This week we've got San Francisco favored by under a TD in Cleveland. That might have gone up now that uh, now it's uh. The quarterback. Well, I don't know if I'm allowed to say player names in this. So now the <laughs> Cleveland quarterback, I believe, isn't playing. It might be over a touchdown now. Uh, Miami is a two-score favorite at home against Carolina. Philly favored by seven in the Meadowlands. And the full slate of games plus props, teasers, and so much more. The action at DraftKings for week six is nearly endless. <laughs> Did you like my... I, I, I like I, I do, quarter, I the quarter thrower the quarter guy. Thrower yeah. guy. Yeah, that I know. I'm a I'm a professional sports analyst. Uh, <laughs> get in on the game day greatness. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code PHLY. New customers can score two hundred dollars instantly in bonus bets when you bet five on the NFL. That's code PHLY only on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 8778-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort. Licensee partner, Golden Nugget Lake Charles. 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance, see sportsbook.draftkings.com slash football terms for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. Uh, I do want to, my I guess the most disappointing part of today's game, I would have liked to obviously cash some of those bets at DraftKings. That would have been nice. Uh, but other than the overall effort we saw I don't I, I hate saying effort because I don't mean how hard they tried yeah, I, I didn't I didn't see a team that wasn't trying no, they, they were just, they were just not very good yeah they yeah. were active they just got outplayed other than the overall what they showed us on the ice my biggest disappointment was although we did see Nick Sealer sticking up for Tyson Forster after he got rocked um we did not get Zach Matt, Zach McEwen versus Nick Delorier, which I was just dying. It would for. have been a great heavyweight battle. I just I want to see a main event fight. Like yeah, we have yeah. one of those guys, and he played against the dude he replaced. I yeah. like Zach Zach McEwen should be our heavyweight. God damn it! And we replaced him with Nick Delorier. I wanted to see those two go at it for the crown. Zach Mack got an assist though. He did. He did get he an did. assist. So Zach Mack was on the scoreboard. It's not just because of my haircut and mustache, but I love Zach McEwen. I'm a big McEwen. I mean, I don't think Zach McEwen was a particularly good player. I can tell you he was a very fun guy to cover. He always, as we've said, he always did stuff. He did stuff. He did a lot of stuff. <laughs> stuff happened when <laughs> stuff, he was on the stuff ice. Stuff definitely you know, happened. Was not, no, no one was ever like, you know what? I didn't notice McEwen. Oh, you noticed You noticed Zach McEwen. <laughs> he did shit out there. Some of it was positive sometimes. I just wanted to see him like, Ah, fight Nick Delorier today. I thought that would have been fun. We did uh, get the Sealer fight, though. And we go into that a little bit. You know, it was... I am. I wouldn't consider myself to be a like. Oh my god! I need a fight in a game. But I do. You. You are that. But <laughs> these games. Yeah. To, yeah I don't fair. need to see. If I was a Colorado fan, I wouldn't be like. I need to see a heavyweight bout every night. But god damn it! I'm watching the Flyers. They're going to win 25 games. <laughs> They're not gonna. They're gonna win more than twenty five. Uh, twenty eight. I. Uh, I think they're gonna win more than that. All right. We'll see. Go on with your. Point. Anyway, I am not like somebody who needs a fight in a game, but to fight for that reason is exactly why you have a guy like Nick Sealer in your lineup. Where Tyson Forrester takes a hit, kind of borderline, maybe could have been a penalty, maybe not, but it was a hard hit. You got one of your young kids. He turned. And, I wouldn't say it was dirty. Yeah. Like he did turn as the hit's yeah. coming. But fuck it, fight for no, him. No, it's a hard hit. You're the, the young kid, guy. The, the kid's on the ice. He maybe is injured. He's, he's at least hurting. And Sealer's like, you know what? You're gonna hit our kid. I'm gonna fight you. And whether that whether that's actually a deterrent, I don't know. I do. It's not. But. <laughs> It definitely, you saw after the fight, Forrester comes comes out off the bench, goes over to the penalty box, gives Sealer a, you know, a fist bump. 
that's the kind of stuff that does build camaraderie and it does make these kids feel like they're going to be supported by the vets on the team. That's, and that's important. That's what I was going to say is there's not a deterrent factor. If there was, this stuff would never happen. Yeah, he wouldn't have got hit And first Ryan place. Reeves would be one of the highest paid guys in the league. Like, oh, we had like, you, you look at, oh, we need guys to, if there's a deterrent factor, like, oh, look at these superstars in Toronto. Yeah, let's give Ryan Reeves the max contract then. <laughs> if the, It's not a deterrent, but... It does help build that camaraderie, yeah. that culture. Guys are going to have each other's back. There's a trust there. There is something to it. I, I don't think they're like, oh, they're like, we saw Nick Sealer get hit in the head later. Or no, it wasn't Sealer. Who took the elbow to the head? I think might have been when he was reaching and it looked like he got. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like it happened later in the game. Someone got hit in the head. Yeah. These things are going to happen. But it does give the guys a feeling someone's going to have my back, exactly. and that is important. It's especially important for the kids because they're going to have a lot of them, as we're seeing, and there's only going to be more as the year goes on. And for somebody like Sealer, I mean, I don't think Delorier was on the ice. No. But, like, Sealer's on the ice. Sealer's not a, a fighter, but he can fight. And he fought. Sealer's here because he fought Delorier. <laughs> That's fair, like, actually. And fair. Half the league wants him because he fought Delorier. <laughs> They're like, we need that guy. Like, if you're going to have a mediocre defenseman, you might as well have the one with the biggest balls. Like, yeah, why not? Uh, so we talked about Sanheim and some of the defense and the four guys. Just looking at this, uh, like, the defense as a whole – we, I think we gave Mark Stahl kind of, like, that's the, all right, Zamula out, Andre in. It's like, really? Didn't Zamula kind of earn the ice time by playing well? Damn. And you see Mark Stahl in there. You see anything out of Mark Stahl today other than, yeah, that's Mark Stahl. Yeah, not really. I mean, I don't think he was as noticeably. Glaringly, he didn't make the big mistakes exactly, today. Exactly, but he's just Mark Stahl. You know, he's he's he is who he is. He's going to eat minutes. I do think, I, I have to think that the plan ultimately is him to cycle into something of a rotational role, but I do think that it's going to take some time for them to get there because he's a vet, because... You're going to have to make some withdrawals. This, it, yeah, you're going to have to make some withdrawals, but <laughs> I just think that there there's a respect factor there from Torts' standpoint. I don't think he wants to bench stall yet, but... He just doesn't look that effective. And like, I, I, you have to, so far, we're through two games. Maybe yes. he'll get better, but also he's 36 years old. He's been in the league for 1,000 games plus. Like, he kind of is what he is. I I wouldn't be disappointed in, and again, game two, they've played six periods. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't be disappointed in the decision to sit Zamula to play Andre. Like, oh, we got to see Emil Andre. Cool. He got yeah. into a game right almost right away. Yeah. Great. If it wasn't, if Torts didn't tell us, oh yeah, like Stahl's not going to play every day. <laughs> like if he didn't tell us yeah. that, if the dude making the decisions didn't raise my like, oh, maybe he's, maybe he's not going to play game two, <laughs> you know, like, cause Danny comes out and says, well, game one, it's the opener. We're going to, we're going to have more vets because it's a respect thing. It's like, well, that's annoying, but all right, game one. And you couple those two comments from the two guys who make all the decisions. You're like, well, there's a good chance Stahl isn't in the lineup, but it seems like that might take a little more time. But I, they told I, us. Yeah. They told us he was not going to play. I was surprised that that Torts offered that up without right? even being pressed. I have always, I think we've talked about this. I've always been skeptical, like kind of like I'll believe it when I see it in terms of you benching Mark Stahl. But look, Walker looks pretty good. He does. So it, and he's the only with Risto out. He's the he's only, only right. right, right in the shot. I get it. Yep. So I think he's pretty safe for now. And if you're gonna want to get somebody in the lineup, to me, it's it's either uh, Sealer or Stall. My guess is they bench Sealer first, just because you know he doesn't have the same cachet that Stall has. You know, Stall is this this. They're both veterans, but Stall is a veteran with a capital V. He's That's, a name. Well, that just, you know what? That gets me excited for what we're going to see out of Nick Sealer because he's got to keep dropping the gloves. Remember Brandon Manning? <laughs> yeah, right. Every time it looked like Brandon Manning was finally going to get pulled out of, a, out of a lineup, he would get in a fight at the end of a game. You're it's not like, wrong. Well, we have to reward him by continuing yeah. to play. He got him. his face punched and, in, so yeah, we like, can't bench him now. And I like Nick <laughs> Sealer, world's better than Brandon Manning. <laughs> he's, be he's a better player. Oh, he's definitely but a better player. I'm than hoping. Manning. We get to see more Nick Sealer fights then because he wants to keep his place in the lineup. And at that point, they'll have no 
choice but to sit in Mark's stall. That's that's the hope. We get everything we've ever wanted. You're galaxy braining this a bit, Bill. I, I want to see the fights, and I want to <laughs> see the kids. Okay. And I'm putting both of those. This is the scenario that gets us both things, okay. Charlie. Okay. That's that's it. Uh, I do want to – listen, I, I don't make it a point to talk about the officiating all that much. Uh, because it was bad. It, early on, it was just tight, and it was like, all right, but they're calling the stupid shit both ways, so whatever. And then all of a sudden, they just started – calling things on the fly yes yeah. <laughs> like you get the sandheim in real time it looked like okay he's, oh, the setting, he's setting a pick and it's an interference play and then it's just two guys kind of skated into each yeah, other neither of them yeah. neither of them saw each other yeah and they just kind of skated into each other and they call sandheim for interference because the flyers are setting up a zone entry so okay in real time it looked worse than it was i get it and then on the ensuing power play, Brady Kachuk just sends Mark Stahl's stick flying. Yeah. Now, in a world that I grew up in, uh, you know, when it was Chris Tarian and Darian Hatcher and it was a melee in front of the net and there basically were no rules within eight feet of the goalie, that goes. Yeah. In today's NHL, That's a penalty. that is very yeah. clearly <laughs> interference and yeah. they're just looking right at it. It's in front of the yeah. net and they go, that's fine. And then... Brady Kachuk immediately scores a goal. Like as Mark Stahl's retrieving his stick, basically. I was there was just a couple of weird calls today. I got some it's comments. Couturier like, got that one penalty for basically four checking. Yeah. Like, like they called it a board, <laughs> and it was like th those are the penalties that I just you're not allowed to bear hug the dudes going into the boards that way. That's holding. That should be legal because the only other way to forecheck in that situation is to and he didn't level them. No. They he just bumped him. Yeah, really. Like it, he was within a safe spot of the boards. It it was just a very oddly officiated. It game. was. And I think a lot of this is probably coming from the fact that I've watched so much baseball, especially over the last <laughs> few weeks, but really all all summer. It's not even when when you're talking about like an umpire strike zone, it's not when an umpire is, is missing calls, that's the infuriating part. It's when an umpire strike zone is inconsistent, that's the infuriating part. Like, if an umpire makes it clear in the first inning that, like, hey, I'm giving that, you know, that that pitch off the outside corner that's, like, you know, a few inches over, but he's calling it the whole game, then the, the, the hitters learn. The pitchers learn. Everyone learns and everyone adapts. But when you call it one time a strike and then same spot and inning later, it's a ball – then it's just ridiculous because the guys can't prepare they for it. They don't know what to swing yeah. at. And that's what the officiating today was, where in the first period, they're calling everything. Then in the second period, they're calling nothing. Then in the third period, they go back to calling everything again. It's just like set a standard and stick to it. Don't set a standard, change the standard, then realize midway through changing the standard that, oh, shit, we changed the standard. We got to go back to what it was originally. It, there was a it's scrum. just incompetence. There was a scrub where Hathaway got punched, and then he's the only one that got called. <laughs> it's like, what, what are we doing here? Like, even but, even, even the, uh, the the Sealer fight. Like, and this, this helped the Flyers, but, like, Sealer very obviously instigated that fight. He should have gotten an instigation penalty. And first they called it roughing because I think they didn't want to give an instigator. And then I guess they decided, well, we can't pretend that wasn't a fight. So let's just give them both five minutes for fighting. When like by rule, that's an instigation penalty. Now help the flyers that he didn't get a 10 minute misconduct and a two minute minor, but that's just bad refing. Like it was just bad refing today. That's I've seen it. Like, it was a it was a playoff game against the Rangers where uh, Voracek and uh, a good fast little scrappy guy for the Rangers I can't remember who it was but uh, like got in a fight and the dude for the Rangers lost his jersey and they're like we're not kicking him out so they just called both for roughing <laughs> and it was like they had their gloves off or were beating the shit out of each <laughs> other he clearly should be kicked out of the game yeah. but uh, yeah we're not doing that and like. All right, that's a playoff judgment call. Yeah, fair. But like this one was, you just saw Forster get leveled, <laughs> and now all of a sudden Nick Sealer is beating up this guy or trying to beat up this guy. That's seventeen minutes, yeah. <laughs> but he only got the five, which is fine. But you just go, what? What are they looking at out there? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's still preseason for some of these officiating oddly, groups, I guess. Oddly officiated game. Uh, you know who it's not preseason for though charlie who's that everyone out there all of the philly sports fans listen we know the birds are back we have the flyers now two games in six or soon 
but it's Red October, baby. And oh, yeah. FOCO has the absolute best officially licensed gear for all sports and fandoms. It's football and tailgating season. We know that. But again, it's Red October. Get your overalls and so much more hoodies, hats, sunglasses, bags, everything you need for a game. Or if you're looking for maybe some uh, good team apparel and accessories, toys, collectibles, novelty items, anything you need, maybe to build a podcast set like this one. FOCO always has our back for Philly sports and they have yours too. get the best gear around by using the link in the description of this show. And for all non presale items, use promo code PHLY. That's promo code PHLY for 10% off FOCO. Get your overalls. Get your overalls. That's, if the Phillies, and remember everyone, Charlie has told us, if the Phillies make the World Series, he will do a show in the overalls. Yeah, I, I think I have to. It's going to be great. I think I, I have to. I might buy them. <laughs> I might be the one. I'm going to get Vince to buy them, but I'll say I did. It. <laughs> um, I want to talk about some of the positives from today's game, because okay. it wasn't all negatives. Now, when you have, I do want to see the final uh let me get the Senators' side of the box score up here. Uh, 14 even strength shots on goal. So they did eventually get some more. Okay. Uh, but, you know, it was three through 35 minutes. Uh, <laughs> they did have some positives. I want to know what a few of yours were. I want to start it off with something we both commented on. Uh, the aggressive penalty kill. Now, it wasn't exactly as effective as the first game. But I like that they are going to take chances that uh, at one point, Ottawa's trying to build some momentum through the neutral zone, and not just one guy, but two stepped up in the neutral zone to try to to try to mute that. Very happy to see it. You're this is not gonna be a very good team. Take some freaking chances. Yeah. And I always want to see an aggressive penalty kill. Make it a weapon. Like the best Flyers teams I can remember had an aggressive penalty kill that was a weapon. They don't have a Mike Richards on this team, but they but, did, but I mean you got Cam Atkinson coming back. You have some guys who can make some yeah. things happen. Travis Konechny showed last yeah. year he could be a penalty kill threat. He's still on the PK. I think what they did last year was because Brad Shaw, who coaches the penalty kill, he very much is inclined to coach an aggressive PK. And they were aggressive in some ways last year in the sense that they're going down the ice, they're trying to create chances. Uh, Allison Lucan called it years ago, the power kill in Columbus. He brought that over. So they were trying to create, but, and I, I did a feature with him when I was back with the athletic last year, a feature with Brad Shaw and Brad Shaw basically said, look, like I would like my penalty kill to be more aggressive. He said, we are aggressive in terms of trying to create chances, but I kind of have the guys pulling back a little bit on how much they're attacking the puck carrier because I just don't think we have the personnel yet to do it. Well, Makes sense. it looks like this year they're kind of unleashing the hounds a little bit, which is cool. And again, on that power play where that they that they scored on in the first period, you saw the negatives where if you chase around the team, sometimes a guy gets open. But it also allows you to break up a lot more zone entry attempts and force more turnovers and hopefully create some shorthanded chances, some more shorthanded chances. So, like, again, I like the idea of coaching a style that is a winning style, even if this team can't quite execute that winning style yet, because it gets you in the habit of doing the types of things that winning teams do so that when they do have the talent to, to fully play that style, everybody's used to it. And when the next CBA comes up and they change the rule that yeah. only shorthanded goals and penalties, you're already set for it. Is that it's, a thing? It's like the Phillies loading up on DHs before they <laughs> there was a DH. You know, God, I... yeah, it's, it's being tested at some levels. Really? And that just tells me it's... It, could Interesting. eventually make its way, which is one of the things I would absolutely do. It would be one of my first day commissioner things. Yeah, you score? Nah, that don't end a power play. You're still on the power play. You score shorty, that ends it. Push offense, make teams. Once you're defending, you've already lost, and it's like, oh, well, our goalie has to be our best penalty killer. He doesn't if you don't allow them to get <laughs> set up. Fair. Like, you know? Fair. Like, oh, yeah, we're our goalie has to be the best penalty killer. Well, you're up against Washington, so good luck. The greatest <laughs> shooter who ever lived is here. Uh, unless you have Dominic Hasek taped to Ron Hextall, I don't think you're going to stop him. Like, be aggressive. Don't let them get set up. So I do like that. My other positive takeaway... They were never going to have any kids on the fourth line unless you count a Lazinski or an Allison as or, a kid. Or Denoye. Or Denoye. Denoye yeah, like had a chance. One of those guys. Yeah. Um, that said, I do like this fourth line. They mix it up. It's a fun fourth they line. They mix it up, and 
they can apply some pressure. It's not just like they're out there gooning it up. Like they have guys who can play. I think Delorier, this is completely unfounded with no stats to back it up. I believe he might have led the team in scoring chances today. He had a good game. He had like two or three yeah, scoring he had a good chances. Delorier was was active. The fourth line was good again. I think the fourth line is going to be a good line. And if if they the whole thing with the fourth line and why they want to keep it together. It's the same reason why in both games, they start they, the they game, started the game with the fourth line. They want that fourth line to be like an identity line and to sort of, you know, pull the other players into the fight and forecheck check and be aggressive and be physical and all that stuff. And I get it. Like, I get why they're prioritizing it. It does make things tougher in terms of fitting kids in the lineup. In the short term, in the long term, though, as we talked about, like guys are going to get hurt. So it'll probably the problem will probably solve itself. But the fourth line looks good so far. I mean, it, it just it looks the exact same as it did in the preseason. And I know a lot of people didn't watch the preseason, but every time that fourth line was together in preseason, they were effective. And these two games, they've been effective. Now, the Islanders game I went to, the I guess it was the final preseason game, like. That was one of the more entertaining lines. Yes. <laughs> they were it was they were fun to watch and it's, it's I know that Charlie and I sometimes prioritize our own entertainment. <laughs> but you don't have to watch. <laughs> this is our job. <laughs> and I realize saying like watching hockey being a job is funny to a lot of people like it's pretty awesome it's not work yeah. you know like my dad's a heavy equipment mechanic he climbs cranes and that's work. that's a job yeah i just do this and i don't even do it all that seriously i i ask you the questions for the real serious <laughs> shit but it is still a job you know yes yes it's, the irs says so yeah. so i yes, say we, so. we might joke that yes. the flyers make us want to die <laughs> yes. but we're not actually going no, to die watching the flyers it's it's a cool job but in January, when they're one of the five worst teams in the league, it can get a little tedious. Having a fun fourth line is at least something. Yeah, yeah. And when they are in a game, you know, I will just never, ever forget the, uh, was it might have been the playoff series against uh, the Islanders in the bubble when Limblom had just come back and one of their fourth line goons is just beating the shit out oh, of no, him. No, that wasn't in the bubble. That was, that was it was post it, that? It, it was the next season when there were no fans in the stands okay. and they were beating up. It was, it was the Islanders. They were beating up on Limblom and everyone the shit just stood out of there. Oscar Limblom yeah. and no one did a damn thing about it. Yeah. Um, that cannot stand. Yeah. I don't care if there's no deterrent factor. Someone has to feel pain over that. Yeah. And I'm cool with Garnett Hathaway and <laughs> and Nick Delorier just kind of going. I don't like on one of the one of Delorier's scoring chances. He gets a shot in front, takes like another whack at the goalie. Someone comes up to him and he does not wait. He just grabs the dude and takes him <laughs> down. I was like, that's awesome. It's, and I'm fine seeing well, that. That was one of my positive takeaways. There's something today. to be said because, like, look, our. Are, is the Wells Fargo Center going to be sold out every night? No, it's probably not going to be sold out most nights this season. But there are going to be thousands upon thousands of fans in that arena for every game. And it would be and the nice. the tickets didn't get any cheaper. Like, it would be nice if there's some entertainment value, even on the nights when they lose 4-1. to one. And guys like Garnet Hathaway and Nick Delorier are for for the the physically oriented fan. The I won't I won't say the old school fan because there's a lot of young young fans who also like hits and fights too. They will enjoy seeing that. And is it a distraction in a sense from what might be a bad hockey team? I guess you could you could argue it's that. But still. People want to go to a game to have a good time. And if the team's losing, they got to find other things to cheer about. And that's one thing they can cheer about. Speaking of the Wells Fargo Center, Charlie, want to mention again, the uh, opener on Tuesday has been moved from seven to six to try to offset a little a bit of the madness that will be the NLCS and the friendly soccer match going on down there. Uh, so we will have a game time change. But you know what never changes? Uh -oh. How great the Game Time app is. Listen, buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With killer deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for the fun you'll have. That's right. Use Game Time. Watch Nick Delorier whoop some ass. All the fun you'll have. Uh, game Time is the place for last-minute ticket deals. Forget planning months in advance. 
advance. Game time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. Get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. The game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. So snag the tickets without the stress with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code PHLY for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code PHLY for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Charlie, what were uh, some more of, did you have any more positives from this one? I didn't have a ton. I I mean, it would be tough. Yeah, I I would say one positive is that, and I don't know if many people were nervous about this to the degree that I was, but I think I going into the season, when it came to Travis Konechny, I thought back to the last time we thought he was breaking out, when he had that great 2019-2020 season. He then doesn't score a goal in the bubble comes back the next season and is a shell of himself. Obviously last year, it looks like his career is back on track. He was point per game, 30 goals, but you worry, is he going to take a step back? Like he did the last time we thought he broke out. It does look like he is the exact same dude from last year, had a goal, a nice goal today on the five on three, had an assist. He's racking up the points early. He just, it's not that he's taken a step. It's just that so far he's proving that this is really Travis it's who connecting. he is. Yes. And that's, you're not looking for, go, what's he, 27, 28 at this point? Like, you're not necessarily looking for a guy to take a step, but it's that consistency. It's the thing we so badly want out of Travis Sandheim. Like, show me who you are. Be that guy consistently. Like, you know, John Tortorell demanded of Owen Tippett last year. Yeah. Show me who you are. Yeah. I don't know what you are. Travis Konechny, if nothing else, has proven to me who he is like I believe him to be a very very good player he could be a line one guy on a good team he is an excellent line two player yes he will be productive in the games he plays in now missed 22 20 22 games last year don't love it but you play hockey and (laughs) you play it the way he does you're gonna get hurt and I like what I'm seeing I'm very pleased with Travis Konechny uh if he ends up being a dude who hangs around and is one of those elder statesmen, you know, he uh, he talked before the game today or after the first period today uh, about the Giroux ceremony prior to the game. He goes, that dude taught me everything he know, like everything I know. Like I owe, I owe so much to Claude Giroux. Wouldn't be the worst thing in the world for him to then pass that down. Now, my God, third hand knowledge, Giroux to connect me. God knows what he's going to be teaching the kids. <laughs> yeah, that's fair, but like. <laughs> You're not starting at the best source to begin with, but I would love to see some of that pass down a little bit because Claude Giroux, as I, it's stupid, but he was the final connection to Ed Snyder. He was the last guy to be a captain while Ed Snyder was alive. Mm -hmm. Like he's the last one to kind of grow up in a world where Mr. Snyder was in the locker room after games, stuff like that. And I don't want to lose that entirely. I mean, you've got Couturier, too. You do. You do. Uh, yeah, okay. That was... He was there for the beginning of Couturier. You're yeah. right. Yeah. So, you got Couturier. You got Konechny. I, I, I'm... I really do go back and forth on the idea of Konechny being a long-term piece because he will have so much trade value. Yes. And... And he's going to be so expensive. He's going to get paid. He's going to get paid. But... I think truthfully, and this is something we talked a little bit about over the course of the show, is that the players are going to determine how long this rebuild this yeah. rebuild takes. And if the team takes a not insignificant step forward this year, I'm not saying they're going to make the playoffs, but if they look better, and then if next year, like if they look better this year to the point where you say, okay, there's enough guys in their mid-20s that this this rebuild might only take three years rather than six then suddenly I'm more open to the idea of keeping Konechny and being like, you know what, cap's going up. As long as you're not asking for, as long as you're not asking to be overpaid, I'll give you a six-year deal. Sure, like it, it would have to be the right, the right contract. You can't lock yourself into a, a contract that's going to kill your cap. I don't gonna, want the over, deal. Yeah, that's going like, to overpay him dramatically. Like he's not that important. But there is a world where they could sign him to an extension and I wouldn't be livid about it. Let me put it that way. I I feel that. Absolutely. Um, it is, 
it is going to be very interesting to see how they handle these guys yeah. and like how long it's going to take. But if they do take that significant step, like you were watching, you know, Cutter Gauthier look excellent in his sophomore season. Uh, you know, if you saw any of the highlights, uh, they showed them during the game today, actually, of uh, Denver, Barkey, Denver Barkey tearing it up. Yeah. Uh, Oliver Bonk had a couple of assists. He's over a point a game the first few games of the season. I think he's got like seven and six or eight and seven, something like that. Love to see that. Like, if these guys then join this team and it's like, all right, Mishkov's not here yet, but we have enough where we think we can take a step forward. And then when he gets here, we're already kind of good. Yeah, we're not getting a bunch of first overall picks, but I think it's pretty damn good. Like, it's not the rebuild we thought it was going to be, but that doesn't mean it won't work. Yeah. I guess is what I'm getting at. Well, I mean, really what it boils down to is if you're not going to have a super long rebuild where you're going to have five, six straight years of top 10, top five picks, then you really need to nail the two or three top 10, top five picks you have. They're hoping they nailed Mitch Koff and Goche. I think... It's relatively certain they nailed Mitchkoff. It's very hard for me to imagine, as long as he comes over, that he's not going to be a really, really good player. Gautier, I am very optimistic about, but guys bust sometimes. Like, I don't think Mitchkoff is going to be a bust. I think Gautier is going to be a very good player, but he does have some bust potential. But if you nail both those picks, all you, in my mind, all you really need is one more blue chipper. One more blue chipper through the draft, which is part part the reason why, you know, I'm fine with them not being that good this year because I think they need one more top 10, ideally a defenseman. But hey, if you get Macklin Celebrini in the, in the lottery, that'd be incredible. Then I think it's all it's full speed ahead oh, because yes. you have then you have your three young guys. You have your I mean, and, and honestly, I'm not even going. I don't think this is overstating it. It's kind of like they could be your your Matthews, Marner and Nylander type. Because I think I think Mitch Koff could be a Matthews Matthews level player. I really do. I don't feel this way, but I think some of our audience is going to laugh at. Oh yeah, the team the that team can't that never win wins the, the playoffs. playoffs. Yeah. Uh, K- but, but seriously, you have no, you, yes. you have you have a, a core of guys all near the same age that can grow together and hopefully win more playoff games than the Maple Leafs have. I just want to respond to the one comment I saw from uh, K Red. He said Coburn told a funny story about accidentally poking Ed Snyder in the eye in the locker room. I I <laughs> oh watched that video. It was on the Nasty Knuckles show this oh, week. Oh, was it? And he they were t- it was during I guess I thought it was the 2010, but maybe the 2012 playoff run uh, where they're all celebrating in the locker room and Mac Miller's playing and like Ed Snyder comes in and he thinks he's looking at him and he goes to give him like the double five. Oh no. And Snyder was not looking and he just like straight up poked him in the eye. He was like, oh, and he like turns to hug chemo and he's looking like I didn't. uh," But like, and that's exactly what I was thinking of when I brought up Ed Snyder there. So good. Uh. We're on the same page here, K-Red. <laughs> uh, do we have anything else from today's game? Because there's just one thing I wanted to bring up that I saw last night that I found interesting. What's that? Um, I, I'm, I'm curious go- to hear what, what's interesting. So <laughs> I saw this stat last night uh, that I was a little surprised by. Now, Malkin scores the first goal in the Penguins game. Crosby has two in the second. Uh, they both score in the same game. Pens win 4 nothing over the Caps. Okay. First... The Penguins have an insane record, 102, 10, and 5, when those two score in the same game. Okay, that makes sense. But also, I would have guessed way over 117 times that they scored in the same game. Now, that could, like, I don't know, the reference point for this, that could be a record for two teammates for all I know. But if if I had to guess, I would have set the over-under at like 300. Well, like how that many seems games? like a ton. They, they're both over a thousand. They're both over a thousand games. Okay. Crosby's so. at like over eleven hundred, I believe. But all obviously, they've both missed a bunch of time. There have been a lot of times where one's in the lineup, one isn't. Yeah. I get it, but and it makes sense. One hundred and seventeen. Yeah, seems but, low. Well, like how many goals does Crosby have in his career? Something like five hundred, four hundred, something like that. Malkin probably, probably. has fewer. I don't know. I, I don't know what their stats are, but it's it's an interesting stat, and it's definitely one of those things where it's like, well, yeah, obviously they're going to win most of the games when their two best players score. No shit. But that's I just like the stat, but like 102, 10 and five is wild. Yeah. Uh, but I just 117 seemed crazy low for dudes who have been together 
since the lockout or since one year well, after see, the, the lockout? The problem is, is that probably 40 of those games were against the Flyers. So it feels like it should be I more. should have looked up the 15 <laughs> games they've lost and seen if any were against the Flyers because they played so many of those ridiculous games where it was like, I don't know, there's 12 fights and someone won 6-5. Yeah. So. Well, it's just like every time they play the Penguins, it's like they start out the game down one nothing because you know Crosby's getting his goal. Yes. He like, has, it's just going to happen. He has a Forsberg shift where he circles the zone two <laughs> times and makes everyone look silly for two straight minutes and scores. And then somehow, like... Scott Hartnell pokes the goalie in the eye and puts one in, and it's 1-1. Oh my God. Like two different ways to build a team, I guess. Yeah, right. Uh, I just saw that stat and found it interesting. I wanted to bring it up today. But do we have uh, anything else on on our, uh, on our today's game, or are we set to wrap up the postgame, Charlie? We're, I think we're set to wrap up the postgame. On uh, on Monday, we will be at the Wells Fargo Center. We're going to be uh, – they're doing their unveiling of the new renovations. All the renovations, the new the locker, locker room, room, everything they've done. I told Kelly because – you know, prior to the Senators game, I had to bring up this at some point. I hope they show us the penalty box because I'm going to look for Martin Havla to see if he's uh, still hiding. Ah, uh, yeah. gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. I mean, are you going <laughs> to jump over the, the glass like the guy who tried to kill Domi? <laughs> <laughs> Only here, man. Only, Only here. here. And like, not, not just anybody. Ty Domi. Ty Domi. Like the baddest motherfucker to yeah, ever like, lace you him ain't up. winning that fight, dude. <laughs> no way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I think, but yeah, we will be down there on Monday and we're going to have, I think some pretty cool YouTube content, all the new yeah. renovations, whatever they're, whatever they're showing us, we're going to be showing you. So make sure you're following our YouTube channel to check that out. And then of course, we'll be back on Tuesday with a little pre and post game action for the home opener. Charlie will be covering the game. I will be right here with you. I assume Kelly will be with me for pregame, but who knows? Uh, who's to say? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know how things work. But that will just about do it for us today. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for hanging out. If you haven't already, you got to hit that subscribe button. Search PHLY Flyers wherever there are podcasts. And uh, you know, follow our YouTube channel. There's going to be a lot of stuff coming up on it. We're going to have some extra content, not just our live shows, but I think the live shows are pretty damn good as well. So you're going to want to follow us here. All right. My name is Bill Matz for Charlie O'Connor. Ring the bell, Philly. Thank you.